The Tasman Sea pounds on the beach way at the northernmost tip of New Zealand. It's constant, unceasing, inexorable, and insistent. A white noise that's present enough to force me to raise my voice to be heard, while at the same time, a soothing balm guiding my footsteps as I discover what it means to be a full-time pedestrian. I'm Allison Young, and this is the PRAG, Unfiltered Adventures of the Blissful Hiker. I am the Blissful Hiker, sometime professional flutist, sometime voice artist, and full-time pedestrian. Every week I share with you what it's like on the trail, why anyone would want to walk that far, and while it may not be a glamorous life, why it's one of the most fulfilling. A big shout out to Lecky Trekking Poles for supporting the PRAG podcast. Lecky supports my body, holds me upright, holds my tent upright, and gives me the strength to walk the length of two countries. If you want to be a blissful hiker, Lecky's should be in your hands. Look, two things. You have a credit card and they speak English. What else do you need? Don't laugh, but it was only a few days before I left St. Paul for New Zealand when I learned what a P-Rag is. I found out right around the same time I met Irene on Facebook. I'd booked a flight to get me as close to the start of the trail as I could, a place called Kerry Kerry, pronounced Kitty Kitty by locals. But it's still 200 kilometers to the start of the trail at Cape Renga. So I was following the Te Araroa page on Facebook for tips, information, trail closures, etc. But I don't always like to post on these pages, Hi, it's Allison, looking for a ride. Mainly because I want to ensure that I've done my research first and not look like a desperate newbie, even if in reality I was a desperate newbie. Well, they did offer lots of advice on how to get to the start, including hitchhiking, definitely not hitchhiking, arranging a ride, or joining a tour group. But this Facebook group was a bit heavy on drama for me, with a side of fear-mongering. So I tried my luck with a private group just for female hikers. And it might have been the same day that I learned about the P-Rag, more on that in just a minute, and I met Irene. Irene's a Kiwi from Hamilton. She was planning to walk the TA in sections, and she planned to start from Cape Renga on October 29th. Well, that was my start date. Or at least, that was the day that my plane would land in New Zealand. Well, we started messaging, and I experienced my first encounter with genuine Kiwi hospitality, a kind of trail magic that's ingrained in the culture. Irene not only suggests we start together— She arranges to meet me at the airport with her family and drive all the way to the Cape together. It was magic, and it only required that I start walking the very same day that I arrive. Bon voyage, or whatever one says prior to a journey such as the one you're about to undertake, may God's peace and blessings follow you and keep you safe. What does anyone remember about their flight to get to the other side of the world, or in my case, flights? Richard calculates I would be 19 hours ahead, or he would be five hours ahead yesterday. I sleep, eat, watch movie after movie, and think about all the kind, generous pearls of wisdom that sent me on my way before I left. Make one friend that will last for the rest of your life. Every so often, I lift the shade to look out over the vast, empty expanse of the Pacific. A waning gibbous moon chases me all the way until finally, Eotearoa, New Zealand. It appears, the land of the long white cloud. We bank over the water, flying low before touching down in a drizzly paradise. It's a sprint of about a half mile in my brand new Las Portivas to customs, where I surrender my tent and stakes, or tint and pigs, to a friendly Auckland biosecurity agent who ensures my tint is clean and free of any predators, flora or fauna. To get to the domestic terminal, I drag a throwaway suitcase filled with my backpack, gear, and bounce boxes along a painted walkway, feeling the humidity like a second skin. And even here, 
smelling a loamy freshness that foreshadows things to come. There's only enough time to snag a new SIM card for my phone before I board a tiny prop plane for the short flight to the Bay of Islands. It reminds me of a ski race in northern Wisconsin, where I was taken by bus from the finish to the start and watched 30 miles of hilly forest pass by, knowing I'd soon be skiing all of it. Here, I'm suspended in puffy clouds above crystalline bays abutting sandy beaches fed by winding streams and estuaries. Hilly, bright green pastures and dark bush see rain falling in the distance and the ocean beyond to infinity. It's a lot further than 30 miles. I mean, if all goes as planned, to walk back to Auckland will take me a month. It's raining when we land. Our small group disembarks outside before rushing to meet friends and family at the tiny terminal. Only international flights require security. People crowd in, and that's when I spot Irene. Half Italian, she wears her long black hair with bangs and is already dressed for hiking. I've arrived alone in so many places and often where people spoke languages, I only managed to understand a little after cramming with language tapes. I'm so touched that Irene comes inside to wait for me, waving as though we're already friends. I'm out of my comfort zone, having reckoned with what really matters in my life and putting to the test risking security for something intangible. Helen Keller wrote, life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Security is an illusion, and bravery, courage, get up and go, embracing adventure, it's simply a way of accepting that we can't hang on tightly and expect we'll be safe. You have to risk a bit of adventure, daring or not, to really live. Through the far, far north, and I'll show you when we get there. <laughs> Myreen's relaxed nature gives me little time to concern myself with maudlin questions. She introduces me to her father, Bryce, and I take the back seat next to his partner, Vern. Hugging the non-existent left shoulder on a wild, curvy roller coaster of road, we shove off, fast and furious. You're listening to The P-Rag, Unfiltered Adventures of the Blissful Hiker. I'm Allison Young, The Blissful Hiker. Well, right around the time I met Irene on the Te Araroa Women's Group on Facebook, something caught my eye on that page. Another American hiker posted this question to the group. Are any of you taking a pee rag? Not wanting to look totally clueless, I went to Dr. Google and plugged in, what is a pee rag? And up came an article written by Stacia Bennett for the trek. She offers the most cogent reasons to tie a bandana to your pack and designate its use as a pee rag, a small accessory with a big job. If you're interested in reading the very article that saved my solo female badass through hiking self, Stacia generously gave me permission to reprint the article on blissfulhiker.com. And there's a link in the show notes. Te Araroa. Oh, Te Araroa. And so it's te, not tea. It's this part of the country we're driving through is called Northland, or the far, far north. Vern and Bryce live in Cayo, where we stop for lunch, and I send forward my bounce box of things I might not be able to find in New Zealand, like the specific shoes and socks I like to wear. We pack my backpack and I change into my hiking gear, and Vern offers to take the huge throwaway suitcase and throwaway clothes to a local charity shop. Then we hop back in the car and continue north on Highway 1, pasture land giving way to drier, sandier scrubland. They chat the entire way in their charming, clipped and nasal Kiwi accent, one that sounds as if every sentence were said with a toothy smile. It's an accent I pretty much can't understand yet. So that makes me half Māori. Uh, that made my father <laughs> And then it begins to rain, then hail, and more rain before clearing to bright sunshine nearly as fast as it began. Dark clouds ahead tell me this sequence is pretty much on rinse and repeat. I'm running on adrenaline and apprehension, 
not quite settling into the fact that we plan to start without so much as a moment for me to catch my breath. To be honest, this isn't my first rodeo. When I hiked the spine of the Alps on the Ger Sank, I also took three flights, landed in Geneva, then traveled by train and bus to this wee country road heading straight uphill towards Nice, 21 days away. It also rained that day as I huddled in a meadow high above Lake Geneva, slugs working their way into my sodden hiking boots. Humor columnist Dave Barry writes, it always rains on tents. Rainstorms will travel thousands of miles against prevailing winds for the opportunity to rain on a tent. All I could do as we sped further and further north is give in to what's to come and trust my full suit of Columbia rain gear would keep me dry. But still, there's nothing more disconcerting than starting a trail, the biggest trail of my life, in rain. Of course, this is something I'll soon learn about New Zealand. It's called the land of the long white cloud for a reason. It rains a lot. But the sun shines too, and often at the same time it rains. Like most things, you can't control the weather. And if you want to be out in it, you gotta take the good with the bad. All at once, we're there the end of the road, the northwesternmost tip of the Aupura Peninsula, the northern end of the North Island of New Zealand. It's called the meeting place where the Tasman Sea meets the Pacific Ocean in a swirl of currents. We have little time to dawdle since it'll be dark in only a few hours and the first campsite called Twilight is eight miles away. Vern shoots video of the two of us walking to the lighthouse at the end of a long spit of land. A pole of myriad signs point in all directions, and we stand on opposite sides, a hand on the post, and a leg kicked out. Tokyo, Sydney, Los Angeles, the South Pole, and Bluff. My destination, one I'll reach probably, hopefully, in five months. It's time to say goodbye before retracing our steps from the lighthouse back up towards the Tepaki Coastal Track, another sign warning us the track is hard to follow at high tide, and that it'll likely take us four and a half hours to get to twilight. The sky clears above a wide track through flax and yucca, azure waves and long rows crashing beneath us as we rise up on high cliffs. Black clouds move along the shoreline, the sun in this ozone-free part of the world baking hot. My feet sink into soft sand before we cross on sharp rock, timing the tides just right to pass over myriad tide pools. The rain is back, and Irene puts on an ultralight minimalist piece of gear, more a bag than a coat. We spot our first trail sign, a plastic orange triangle nailed onto a wooden post. It leads us away from the beach, up onto a sandy bluff dotted with bright yellow lupin. I sure hope we're not lost, Irene says, just as I realize we most surely are. This can't be a good sign. You're listening to The P-Rag, Unfiltered Adventures of the Blissful Hiker. I'm Allison Young, The Blissful Hiker. And a big shout out to Lecky for supporting the podcast. Lecky trekking poles hold me upright, support my tint, and they give me the strength to walk the length of two countries. If you want to be a blissful hiker, Lecky's should be in your hands. You can read more about my hikes and see the show notes at thepeerag.com and feel free to leave a comment too. Irene and I were never really lost, just misguided. Truth is, we were only about 10 minutes out of our way, so we simply backtrack on sinky sand. Further up the beach, a large stream rushes toward breaking waves. Irene asks if I'll take my shoes off to cross. My spirits dampened ever so much from our wrong turn. I say, heck no, and plunge up to my thighs in cool, fresh water, certain this is not the first time I'll be soaking wet. Oyster catchers peep at us as we pass, their eyes looking askance. Sponges, jellyfish, and small piles of broken shells fan out at the water's edge. 
A couple of German hikers help us across a tricky rock hop as waves push a little too close. Ahead is Harangi Hill, with stunning views through a wind tunnel that sends sand and small rocks at me like exfoliates. We're moving fast now, and we see Twilight Camp ahead. At least it's Notch in a distant cliff at the end of a horseshoe-shaped beach. It all seems a bit unreal, the route taking us under the curve of a rainbow towards another squall line and tonight's destination. Twilight is a beautifully manicured patch of grass on a cliff up a set of wooden stairs from the beach. There's an octagonal-shaped cabana, a water tank, and a toilet, which I learned the Kiwis call a long drop. Two couples, French and Dutch, greet us overloaded with gear. An English woman named Amelia, strong and determined, sets her tent close to Jean Christophe, a quiet Frenchman. Everyone changes into tights and down as the night turns cool, the wind relentless. I set my tint in the lee of the cabana, not certain it will make much difference if the wind changes direction, then send a note home. Night one, a whirlwind start. We're safe and happy. In the waning light, I think about the clarity of this part of the trail and my confusion about what's to come. For four days, the trail notes are clear about where to camp, where to get water, and how to plan each day with the tides and distances. After here, things begin to muddle in my mind, and no matter how many times I read the trail notes or follow blogs of those who went before me, I can't seem to wrap my head around what's to come. I'm pretty sure it's due to inexperience, something I'm terrified to admit, especially after putting everything on the line to come here. The ocean is loud and unyielding, broken by two or three downpours pattering in my tent's taut, taffeta-like roof. The waves finally calm, but at this lonely hour, even the Southern Cross is obliterated by the moon's brightness. I feel taunted by it all. We are here, they seem to say, and you are just passing through on your brief journey. Brief on the northernmost tip-top of New Zealand, and brief on our spinning sphere. But these are the musings of an insomniac. I'll go back to sleep now because tomorrow I begin 90 Mile Beach, a long, exposed, blister-inducing, tide-timing stretch of concrete hard sand. But before I do that, I pop out of my tent, find some bushes, and inaugurate my first P-Rag. You can subscribe to the show at thepirag.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. And write me a review. I'll read some of the gems at the end of the show, like this cool one from Lori Wyland after episode one. I am truly honored to be the one who bought your professional flute. I'm having my own blissful adventures playing it. Or this one from Michael Infante, who tells me he was inspired not to wonder anymore but to take the chance and find out. Until next week on the P-Rag, when we'll walk the 90-mile beach, happy trails.